Jeeves and Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. And we're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on TV, DAB and online. Today we'll be discussing the Labour Party. Who are they? What do they stand for? And under Sir Keir Starmer's leadership, where are they going? Nowhere fast, if you ask me. We'll have the latest on the purchase of Chelsea Football Club and we'll be joined by Eurovision Royalty to take part in our Scrap Reform Keep segment. But first, it's the news with Ray Addison. Thanks, Darren. It's coming up to one minute past two. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. The Deputy Prime Minister has vowed to reform the Northern Ireland Protocol to improve stability in Northern Ireland following Sinn Féin's success in the Stormont elections. The party won 27 seats, overtaking the DUP, which dropped to 25. The region has been without a power-sharing executive for several months after the DUP refused to be involved in protest over the post-Brexit protocol agreement. Former First Minister and GB News presenter Arlene Foster says the result will not cause a significant shift in the political balance. Of course, uh, it is a big moment uh, in Northern Ireland's history. It's the first time that uh, a Republican has been uh, in the position to take the First Minister's post. However, we should not get carried away in terms of uh, our place within the United Kingdom because actually there has been no shift uh, in terms of those who support the Union uh, and those who support breaking away. Ukrainian fighters at the besieged Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol have vowed to continue fighting as long as they're alive. The deputy commander of the regiment, sheltering in the plant, says they don't have much time left as they're under intense shelling. It comes as President Zelensky announced that all 300 women, children and elderly have been rescued from the steelworks. The Foreign Secretary has accused Russia of war crimes after a bomb destroyed a school in Luhansk in which 90 people were sheltering. Writing on social media, Liz Truss said the deliberate targeting of civilians and infrastructure amounts to war crimes. The governor of Luhansk says at least two people have been killed, with 60 others remain buried under rubble and they're feared dead. An aircraft bomb went into a school. Unfortunately, it's completely destroyed. Right now, emergency service workers are clearing the debris, but there were 60 people hiding from the shelling. The school was destroyed completely. Considering it was an aircraft bomb, the temperature was wild. Of course, the emergency services workers will try to clear the debris as fast as they can, but the chances of people still being alive are small. But we hope for the best. Senior Tories are accusing Sir Keir Starmer of hypocrisy as new details emerged into allegations that he broke lockdown rules last year. The Mail on Sunday has published a leaked memo which appears to suggest that a beer and curry event attended by the Labour leader and his deputy was pre-planned. 
Sakir insists that no lockdown rules were broken. However, police in Durham are investigating. Sakir is resisting calls to resign, despite previously saying that the Prime Minister should step down over parties held at number 10. Boris Johnson says he will deliver a so-called Super 7 of Brexit bills in the Queen's speech on Tuesday, which he claims will cut red tape inherited from the European Union. The Prime Minister told the Sunday Express that the new laws range from data reform to financial services, allowing Britain to, quote, thrive as a modern, dynamic and independent country. He's also expected to unveil measures to help struggling town centres, including plans to force landlords to rent out empty shops and make pavement cafes a permanent fixture. The Home Office is reviewing its security after protesters heckled Priti Patel at the Tory Spring Dinner in Nottinghamshire. And um, I actually just want to start... Priti Patel, your racist policies are killing people. Seven activists from the Green New Deal Rising Group bought tickets to the event and then criticised government plans to send migrants to Rwanda. They accused the Home Secretary of racist and inhumane policies. Some of those at the dinner booed the activists, who were then quickly led away. Hong Kong has elected its new chief executive. John Lee, the sole candidate, was endorsed for the city's top job by a pro-Beijing committee. Lee said it was his historic mission to lead a new chapter for Hong Kong. The former Secretary for Security was responsible for implementing China's national security law to arrest pro-democracy demonstrators and shut down liberal media, media outlets. A bridge has collapsed in northern Pakistan, swept away by water from a melted glacier. A recent heat rave caused huge amounts of water to run into the stream in Hassanabad and surrounding areas. Local media quote experts as saying that the water volume at the Shispa Glacier Lake increased by 40% over the past 20 days. A further 33 glacial lakes are at risk of bursting soon. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's cooking up on the show today. What does the future hold for the Labour Party? Their leader, Sakia Starmer, is being investigated for beer gate. Diane Abbott has said that he should consider his position if he's fined. And apparently, MPs Wes Streeton and Rachel Reeves are getting ready for leadership bids. Chelsea Football Club have found a buyer. They've agreed terms of a 4.2 billion quid sale of the club to the consortium led by Todd Bowley. We'll be finding out more about this consortium and where all of this money will end up. And on our Scrap Reform Keep segment, we'll be putting the Eurovision Song Contest through its paces. I'll be joined by none other than the former Bucks Fizz singer and Eurovision winner, Jay Aston. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. But as usual, I'd love to know your thoughts on the Labour Party. What do you think the future holds for them? Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on GBviews at GBnews.uk. Watch us online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Our page contains loads of brilliant content. Cheers very much. Today's VE Day, just days after many of us have voted in elections and spent the last few days watching commentators and politicians clash over what those election results mean, we ought to remember and be thankful that we're actually able to do that. That prosperous, vibrant democracy that we all enjoy is only possible thanks to the heroism of our greatest generation. This generation defeated the tyranny unleashed across Europe by Adolf Hitler. The greatest generation that I hope we never forget. The selfless sacrifice offered so that generations of us since then could take our freedom for granted. You might well be enjoying a Sunday in the house in front of the telly. You could be enjoying the hope and promise of spring offered in me. Or enjoying a spirited little news channel trying to give British communities a voice and a platform that speaks to them. Whatever it is that you're up to, remember that 77 years on, those who died rather than give way to violence and tyranny and be thankful 
It's a time to feel pride in how our nation still offers support and sustenance to the Ukrainian people during their fight against tyranny and oppression. We may well be a small nation, but I reckon we can still pack quite a punch in the name of freedom and liberty. Look at all those cannons being launched with God save the Queen uttered by Ukrainian soldiers. In the way in which only our nation's one constant can do, Her Majesty the Queen's long life has chronicled much of our national story. These previously unseen images offer us a rare and candid glimpse of the carefree and happy nature of our monarch in the years after the war. For our radio listeners, we're just showing you some images there taken from hundreds of private homemade recordings released to the BBC for a new documentary marking the Platinum Jubilee. I was especially touched by an image of a young Princess Elizabeth, 20 year old, one year after the war, start staring happily at her engagement ring. And it reminds you of the promise of a wedding that, as we know, would bind together two people, Princess Elizabeth and Prince, the later Prince Philip, two people that would serve a nation and build a lifetime of happy memories together. The late and great Prince Philip had designed the ring himself, using jewels taken from his mother's tiara, really touching stuff. The late and great Prince Philip actually was the source of the Queen's happiness. And I think the Queen's happiness, our happiness, our freedom and our future were secured because of the brave British boys and girls and Commonwealth nations, of course, that sacrificed so much. So we today, here and now, could afford to take things for granted. So I say, folks, let's remember them today. Let's never ever forget what made us great then still makes us great today. And in an age in which everything about Britain, whether that be our culture, our history, our values, our art, our statues, our way of life, I could go on and on, all of that is under attack, the very bedrock of what we hold dear. Let's remember what convinced those lads and lasses that it was all worth fighting to protect. Now, folks, today I think it's right we take a little look at the health of the Labour Party, the main opposition to the Tory government. But it feels like this party is in disarray. Durham police are investigating Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer over so-called beer gate. The Labour MP Diane Abbott has said that he should consider his position if he's given a fixed penalty notice. The Daily Mail report that Rachel Reeves and Wes Streeton are accused of sizing up leadership bids. So here to discuss what the future holds for the Labour Party, I'm joined by Stephen Pound, former Labour Party MP and Shadow Minister for Northern Ireland, and Adrian Bailey, former Labour MP for West Bromwich West. Stephen, I'll start with you, please. When you look at the Labour Party today, does it feel to you like a party on the rise? Are the party on the way up now, post-Corbynism? Well, I, I think in all honesty, Darren, it's a party that's emerging from the shadows and emerging from the darkness. But before I go into this, would you allow me to thank you profoundly for the comments you made earlier on about BE Day? Very, very few media outlets in this country have mentioned this. And I have to say, I'm actually speaking to you today from the Royal British Legion um, in Greenford. And my friend Terry has just actually passed me a tot um, of something medicinal um, in a GB News mug. So thank you very, very much indeed for mentioning that. It means a lot to us here in Greenford at the Royal British Legion. But look, what, we didn't have a massive breakthrough last Thursday. We did ludicrously well in London, except for you know, one or two uh, odd, odd spots. But in, in reality, this is, as has been said, a work in progress. You can't talk about Wes Streeting or Rachel Reeves being candidates. People don't throw their hats into the ring. You know and I know that when you actually come to a leadership campaign, it's those who show early who fall first. It's always the dark horses, the ones who come yeah. through later on. So we're nowhere near that. What we are at is at a stage where... And, and we'll talk, maybe talk about Beergate later on. I don't know. That's up to you. But the reality is that the Labour Party is back on the pitch. A few years ago, we weren't on the pitch. We are now playing. We're now a player. And we now are in there with a chance. We have a sensible, viable, sober, serious alternative to, frankly, the, the present prime minister, who is, I think, an embarrassment. 
Adrian, do you think that, which Stephen touched on it ever so slightly, the way in which the Labour Party did well in London, I think it's safe to say, do you think that the Labour Party's values actually can stretch beyond London? Absolutely. But uh, first of all, can I say that I find this debate rather strange when on Friday morning I woke up for the first time uh, after an election to feel great, to hear good news that Labour had gained seats, that we had actually taken local authorities that we'd never in our wildest dreams have ever thought that we'd gain. And I suddenly find that we're questioning our leader, or some people are questioning our leader. Uh, but where, though, not Adrian, only, where are you talking just, about just here, Darren, those historic not only wings? has uh, Kia delivered a very good, not an, a general election winning performance, but nonetheless a very good performance. He is eviscerating uh, Boris Johnson in the House of Commons. The Tories are rattled and they see him as a, a future prime minister. We should not undermine that. I, well, I'm sorry, Adrian, but I don't accept that the country right now is crying out and saying Keir, Sir Keir Starmer is this country's next prime minister. I, I just don't think there's any evidence of that. You did well in London, but you are still the party of London. I did not say that the country as a whole is. I have well, you said he stands to win time. a general election no, and he's well, trouncing Boris Johnson. Uh, council election victories midterm do not necessarily herald a general election victory subsequently. What I do say, and I repeat what Steve has said before, this is work in progress. We have made a very good start now. There are huge challenges ahead, not least in areas such as I used to represent in the West Bromwich area, Wolverhampton, the black country, where we are, in my view, underperforming. And I have strong views about where Keir needs to in order to ensure that we deliver in this area as well as, as in some of the other areas. But the fact is, we are on our way back. If we make the right decisions, do the right things, we are a potential general election uh, victor next time. So Adrian, and how can you... To show that unity to back here in order that, that this can actually happen. Right. Briefly, Adrian, I wonder if you can, you touched on what Sir Keir Starmer can actually do. How can he actually rebuild the trust with communities like that from where I come from in County Durham? Communities that feel, frankly, utterly betrayed by a Labour Party that tried to do all it could to overturn a vote for Brexit, for example. They feel utterly disillusioned with the modern, the contemporary Labour Party. They actually feel like it speaks more, as I say, for London than it does for communities like County Durham or like the one in Wolverhampton that you've just mentioned. How does Sir Keir Starmer rebuild that trust? Can I say that uh, I represent a Sandwell constituency rather than the Wolverhampton, but they're not dissimilar in their social characteristics. Um, there's a, a number of ways that we can do so. Uh, first of all, um, as a result of lockdown, campaigning seized, ceased with local Labour parties and has not yet been fully resurrected. And therefore we've had a campaign vacuum at local level, which has hampered our ability to get Labour's message across to people on the doorstep. Right. As things stand at the moment, our vote is increasing, but because the former UKIP vote is largely aggregating around the Tory vote, we're having to raise our games to level which historically we've not needed to in order to win these. The fact is that in these local elections, we can poll considerably higher than we did in uh, 2019. Okay. But then we held all our local election seats. This time we didn't. And that is a real problem because we're having to perform at a level which we've not historically had to. Right. And that involves more consultation with local people, uh, resurrecting the local Labour Party so that they once again become effective campaigning organisations. You cannot run elections in the black country from Westminster. And that is a message that I am intending to get through 
tactic here so that he works with me and others or okay, long okay. history delivery in the area in order to deliver another Labour victory in the Right, area. yeah. I mean, there are certain households that I can think of off the top of my head and communities like that that you're speaking of that the Labour Party needs to win over in order to win a general election. And I'm telling you, I don't think they'd take too kindly to the Labour Party knocking on their door. But writing in the Daily Mail, Stephen, about Beergate, Dan Hodges has said that the voters will forgive many things, Sir Keir, but self-righteous hypocrisy is just not one of them. Do you actually think that, yep, Sir Keir has had a good set of local elections in certain areas, but if he is fined, is this not the end of his career as leader of the Labour Party? Well, if it's the end of his career, it's the end of Boris Johnson's career as well. If Keir goes, Boris goes. If one's got to go for one, if, if he does get a fixed penalty notice, dear God, Boris Johnson's had 15 of these accusations. He's had all these. So, I mean, really, the only people who are going to be celebrating there are the Liberals, and they're going to be drinking doubles on this one. So that isn't the case. But your, your point earlier on about Durham, I remember speaking to Sacriston Working Men's Club, which was a, a difficult gig, to be honest, for a, for a London Labour MP. And it suddenly occurred to me that it's not good enough for the Labour Party to say, vote for us, we're not Boris Johnson, we're not the Tories. We have to actually get that message out. And when I was talking to the, I mean, admittedly, most of the people in the Sacriston Working Men's Club were talking about leak growing and bizarre things that you do up there. But they really, really wanted to get a positive post-mining community message. This is yeah. a community that is changing. And the Labour Party hasn't quite yet sealed that deal. So we can't just say, vote for us because we're not Boris Johnson. We have to do more, as, as Adrian did and all of us did back in the day. But there is real work to do. But on, on the beer gate thing, I have to say, Prosecco and, you know, and canopies is, is Boris Johnson. Curry and beer is Labour. I quite like that image. But if Boris goes, Keir goes. If Keir goes, right. Boris goes. Stephen, the Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves has said that she's pleased that Jeremy Corbyn isn't Prime Minister. I wonder to what extent do you think Jeremy Corbyn is responsible for toxifying, frankly, the Labour Party brand? Well, but, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was, is a, a teetotal of vegetarian, so he wouldn't have had a meat curry and a beer up, up in <laughs> Durham, which is a, a probably doesn't relate to, to most of the people. Look, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, like, rightly or wrongly, did introduce an element of toxicity into the Labour Party in one specific area. We know, we all know what that area was. You know, it was the, the, the anti-Semitism about that. And it's taken a long time to drain that swamp. I think if you actually have a look at Labour won Barnet, one of the most Jewish constituencies, boroughs in the country, 25% um, of the population of Barnet identify themselves as Jewish. We won that. We're on the way back there. I think we have detox. We have actually drained that okay. swamp. But God, it was hard work. Adrian, we're speaking there about the, the victories over this past week. I mean, you were an MP between 2000 and 2019. You stepped down before the general election. The Tories took over your ward, though, as they did with many other of these red wall seats. How, do, what, what did you do wrong, I wonder? <laughs> right. So I say, I'm not quite clear uh, what you're saying here. They won the general election. They haven't taken over all our wards in the local elections. In fact, we actually very narrowly lost two out of the seven. That's hardly a sweeping victory for the Tories. And indeed, if you look at all the um, West Bromwich constituencies and Hales Owen and Rowley, we actually have outpolled the Tories. So let's get everything in perspective. And again, I'm fully aware that outpolling uh, the Tories in local elections midterm does not necessarily mean that you're going to outpoll them at a general election. But it is certainly not grounds for trying to get rid of your party uh, leader. The fact is we're making progress. We've got one heck of a lot to do. Yeah. And I certainly think the Labour Party, NEC and organisation has to be ramped up in order to work with local people to get that message across to them in order that the, we will have the building blocks okay. at a local level to deliver a general election victory. We're going to have to end it there, folks, but thank you very much for your contribution and talking about the Labour Party today. I actually think, you know, Sir Keir Starmer can do whatever he wants, but ultimately all it takes is one of the hard left members of the Parliamentary Labour Party to say something daft, and then it all goes to pot. But hey-ho, interesting times ahead. Stephen past. Pound, former <laughs> Labour Party MP and Shadow Minister for Northern Ireland, and Adrian Bailey, former 
Labour MP for Sandwell. Thank you very much for your time. Folks, plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. We'll be joined by Jay Aston to discuss the Eurovision Song Contest. And we'll be talking about the urgency to get your passport renewed if you're wanting to get away this summer. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking fine for much of the country, though there will be a few showers in the north. Let's take a look at the details. Heading first to southwest England, and here, after a rather cloudy start to the day, it'll be mostly sunny to end, with generally light winds too. A similar picture over in the southeast. Plenty of late sunshine this evening, leading into a clear night, although that does mean it will turn quite chilly. There'll be patchy cloud for most of Wales this evening, but it's going to stay dry and many should have some decent sunny breaks. That's how it's also looking around the West Midlands, with some sunny spells lingering through the evening and temperatures holding up into the high teens Celsius. It should feel quite warm. There's a small chance of one or two showers around northern England this evening, but for many it will be dry with some late sunny breaks. Then it will also feel cooler near the coast. There'll also be one or two showers across Scotland. Far northern and northwestern parts may be cloudier with a little bit of rain. Rain. Otherwise, there will be some sunny spells. In Northern Ireland, it's looking largely cloudy, especially in the west, where a few spots of rain are likely. The best of any late sunshine will be in the east. So, wet and blustery weather will push in from the northwest overnight, whilst it will turn chilly under clear skies in the southeast. And that's how it's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me, Anaya Falar and Iman for the discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here. From big ideas to questions shaping the public conversation, we tackle the moral, cultural and political implications of news stories. We need to share this conversation democratically. It has become so toxic, this debate. They relish this kind of discourse. From fascinating guests to challenging ideas, you won't want to miss it. The discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here, GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Hello and welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now folks, passport applications are currently suffering huge delays as a result of backlog issues at the passport office. A backlog of paperwork has meant that Britons have been left waiting for more than 10 weeks for renewals. So let's pop to our virtual classroom and find out why and what can be done about it. Joining me for a discussion on this is Lisa Minow, travel editor at The Sun. Hiya, Lisa. Lisa, what's going on here? Do you think many people are going to be left thinking, oh, my word, I can't get away this summer? Well, we've already seen it. We've seen people unable to go away, um, you know, in their hundreds, perhaps thousands over the last couple of weeks, uh, where passports have just simply not come back in time for trips that were perhaps very long planned, perhaps trips that actually people had already, you know, delayed several times because of the pandemic. So we've already seen this as a big issue. Um, in terms of some readers themselves, I've had families unable to go on long promised trips. Um, unfortunately, someone who's actually lost their passport and then had to try to get a new one, we're never going to get it in time. And that's going to put their wedding in Barbados at risk. So wow. it really is a huge issue at the moment. Yeah. And if people haven't renewed their passport and are hoping to get away this summer, what would your advice be? Would it, I assume, get it in now? Yeah, I mean, if you've got a holiday booked, yes, get it in as soon as possible. Um, we're talking about 10 weeks minimum, they're saying at the moment for passports. So if you're looking at going away um, in those first couple of weeks of the school summer holidays, that's now. It is 10 mm. weeks from now um, to the start of the summer holidays. So definitely get them in as soon as possible. Um, what people are really struggling with is that when they do need a passport in a really urgent situation, right now they can't even get an appointment for um, one of these sort of on-the-day passports or even the week-long service. Um, um, they cost more, in fact, almost double uh, the price of a normal passport renewal. But people can't even get appointments for that at the moment. So there wow. really does seem to be a huge labour shortage at the moment. And is this post-pandemic? What's responsible for these massive backlogs? I mean, it very definitely is post-pandemic. What's baffling is why they, you know, they knew this was going to happen. They knew that 4.5 million people had yet to renew their passports after two years where people weren't travelling. Um, so they could have anticipated that once they dropped all these travel restrictions, which they did, um, that people were then instantly going to want to go away, send their passports off. And this is the situation we've come to. Now, I mean, I can understand that during the lockdowns, it would have been very difficult for the passport office to operate from home. You know, we're talking about people's sensitive information information here. Um, you can't just run that off a, a home computer. Um, I do understand this has to be done under you know, really secure servers. Um, but there should have been an anticipation of the fact that once those travel oh, exactly. restrictions were lifted, there would be a huge rush. Yeah. I mean, Lisa, where do you stand then on the Prime Minister saying, come on, folks, if you don't get your act together, threatening them basically with privatisation? Yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to help in the in the in the short term. Um, I mean, really, generally before the pandemic, there wasn't really an issue with passports. Um, there was always going to be perhaps a perfect storm because once we've had um, the Brexit, um, that has has actually had an impact on some people's passports. Where at the moment your expiry is ten years from the date of the start of that passport. Um, many of our passports perhaps had a July start date and a September end date because they'd added on the months from your previous passport. From now on, that doesn't count. It is from the date of the uh, sort of passport issue that your passport is then 10 years, it has to be. Then on top of that, you have to have three months to go into Europe, not six months. Some yeah. airlines have been incorrectly telling people it was six months, it is three months. Um, and then that's going to be having more of an impact on people having to renew their passports. Um, so you could see this was going to be the perfect storm. But well, exactly. I think my only... My only advice would be if you have got your holiday booked, then obviously you've got no choice. You've got to get it and your passport needs renewing. You've got to get it done as soon as possible. Um, if you haven't yet booked a holiday, renew your passport, get that sorted, then start thinking about yeah. actually booking the trip because you could lose the trip if you can't get away. Definitely. There'll be a lot of very upset people, Lisa, I dare say. Yeah. Lisa Minnell, travel editor at The Sun, thank you very much for your time thank today. You. Now, folks, you're with GB News on telly and DAB Radio. Next, we'll be discussing the sale of Chelsea Football Club. And in Scrap Reform Keep, we'll be joined by the Eurovision winner, Jay Aston. Now, though, it's time for a check on the news headlines with Ray. Thanks, Darren. It's 2.32. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. 
The Deputy Prime Minister has vowed to reform the Northern Ireland Protocol to improve stability in Northern Ireland following Sinn Féin's success in the Stormont elections. The party won 27 seats, overtaking the DUP, which dropped down to 25. The region has been without a power-sharing executive for several months after the DUP refused to be involved in protest over the post-Brexit protocol agreement. Senior Tories are accusing Sir Keir Starmer of hypocrisy as details emerged into allegations that he broke lockdown rules last year. The Mail on Sunday has published a leaked memo which appears to suggest that a beer and curry event attended by the Labour leader and his deputy Angela Rayner was pre-planned. Sir Keir insists no lockdown rules were broken, however police in Durham are investigating. He's resisting calls to resign despite previously saying that the Prime Minister should step down over parties at number Number 10. Boris Johnson says he'll deliver a so-called Super 7 of Brexit bills in the Queen's speech on Tuesday, which he says will cut red tape inherited from the EU. The Prime Minister told the Sunday Express that the new laws range from data reform to financial services, allowing Britain to, quote, thrive as a modern, dynamic and independent country. He's also expected to unveil measures to help struggling town centres, including plans to force landlords to rent out empty shops. And Ukrainian fighters at the besieged Avostal steel plant in Mariupol have vowed to continue fighting as long as they're alive. The deputy commander of the regiment sheltering in the plant says they don't have much time left as they're under intense shelling. It comes as President Zelensky announced that all 300 women, children and elderly have been rescued from the steelworks. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Stay with us, Real Britain, with Darren. We'll be back in just a moment. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, it's 2.36 and this is a story that we've covered closely here on Real Britain. Chelsea Football Club's new owners are all but confirmed. Exciting times ahead. The club have agreed terms on its £4.2 billion sale to a consortium led by Todd Bowley. I'm joined now by Kieran Maguire, finance lecturer at the University of Liverpool, to discuss this. Kieran, you are the man I want to talk to about this. If you take we're back, though, why have Chelsea been put up for sale in the first place? Why would you ever want to get rid of a club like Chelsea? 
Well, Chelsea were owned by a uh, Roman oligarch, uh, sorry, Roman Abramovich, the Russian oligarch. And uh, he ran the club for 19 years. Uh, the club lost over £900,000 a week during that period. But he was he was not bothered about that. He was he was willing to run Chelsea as a sort of as an executive toy, as a trophy asset, and generate trophies. So so he was tended to be popular with Chelsea fans himself. Uh, he announced in early March, uh, following the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, that the club was up for sale, and he said at the time that the net proceeds. Uh, were to go to the victims of the Ukraine conflict, as, as described in a press release. Um, some cynics say that that was uh, to try to prevent the UK government imposing sanctions on him, but uh, the government uh, took things into consideration and, and did impose sanctions on all of Roman Abramovich's assets, but gave a special licence to Chelsea Football Club to allow it to continue to trade right. until the 31st of May. So, Kieran, was this inevitable then? Do you think he would have had to give up the club, even if he hadn't said in this press statement, this extraordinary press statement, you know, I'll sell the club and I'll give the profits, the proceeds over to the Ukrainian re relief effort? Well, he, he certainly would have... Uh... Had, had to have no involvement in terms of the running of Chelsea. And that has been the case since his assets were frozen. Um, I, I think he was aware that he was under pressure. All of his other assets, his property assets in the UK, have been frozen. They've also been frozen in Jersey, uh, where one of his controlling companies called Cambly International operates. Nice. Um, and that's lent Chelsea Football Club £1.5 billion. Right, OK, wow. I mean, these figures are just extraordinary, aren't they? The, the amount of money that's swilling around the Premier League now is just incredible. But this £4.25 billion sale of the club to this consortium led by Todd Bowley, tell me about what do we know about Todd? Um, well, Todd Bowley owns uh, a number of US sports franchises uh, based in the US, so, so he's... he's uh, He's familiar with the sports industry, but the American version of sport, I think, is very different to, to what we're familiar here uh, in, in England in the sense that uh, th it, it is a franchise. There's no relegation. Um, there's, there's very tight control over costs. So therefore, it's a profitable business, whereas what we see in the Premier League, whilst it's incredibly popular, uh, in order to be successful, you have to pay money for talent, and, and talent, uh, you know, talent is expensive. So quite a few clubs in in the Premier League uh, do lose money, and, and Chelsea have lost more money under Roman Abramovich than any other club in Premier League history. But done phenomenally well. I mean, Kieran, how popular is the Premier League in America? What would an American want to buy Chelsea Football Club for? Is this status? Um, I don't think so. It, it, it appears that uh, Todd Bowley's consortium is backed by a private equity company and, and private equity companies that they're there to to look after the interests of of individual investors. So their focus is on a financial rather than a sporting return. Having said that, uh, in, in order to to generate money in the Premier League, you need to be in the ch in the Champions League itself. That can be worth up to an extra £150 million a year. So therefore, we, we would expect them to make money. I, I think the big issue as far as uh, the American owners are concerned is that they do feel that, that English football is undervalued compared to how much it would cost to buy uh, an American NBA or NFL team. Right. So how does this compare the 4.25 billion figure? How does this compare with international and indeed national statistics on, on the amount of money paid for a, one individual club? Is this, is this breaking any records or not far off doing so? Where are we at there? Oh, this, this is by far the, the highest figure ever paid for a football club. If we go back to 2005, Manchester United was sold for around about 770 million. Uh, you know, the, the Chelsea officer, the Chelsea officer offer, whilst it's being quoted as 4.25 billion, it's actually 2.5 billion for the club. And then Todd Bowley has said, well, we intend to upgrade uh, Stamford Bridge. We, imprint, we intend to invest in the squad. And that's where the other 1.75 comes from. But I think the highest offer that we're currently seeing is around about 880 million for one of the Italian clubs. Um, so, so Chelsea's is probably three times the value of, wow. of any deal in, in football history.
Yeah, and Kieran, plenty of money then going into the club. Do you think Chelsea's status as one of the top performing clubs in English history, certainly at this current time, that's going to go, you know, they'll be fine from here on out, won't they? Chelsea fans can get pretty excited about their future. Well, I mean, Chelsea's uh, his history under Roma Abramovich is, is unprecedented as far as the club is concerned. Remember, all of this money is going to the, the shareholders in Chelsea, who who presently, of course, are Roman Abramovich himself. Um, and, and then that money will be ring-fenced. The government will ensure that it goes into a secure account. And, and I presume the government will then appoint trustees to a charity to distribute the, the, the money in terms of relief, in terms of what's happened in Ukraine. So none of this money was actually physically going to go into the coffers of, of Chelsea in terms of a transfer budget. But what it does do is it potentially secures the future of the club beyond the 31st of May. And Kieran, where do we stand on foreign buyers of, of football clubs to begin with? I mean, I'm a Newcastle United fan, so I'm not going to point any fingers anytime soon. But where do we stand on, on this, the controversial topic of foreign actors buying football clubs? This is something that's under intense scrutiny as far as the Premier League's concerned, isn't it? Well, the, the Premier League has a, has something what's referred to as the owners and directors test. And the way that that operates is it's, it looks at two things. First of all, do you have any unspent criminal convictions? And there's no evidence of that. And secondly, can you show evidence that you have the money to, to run the club operationally for at least two years? And the, the, uh, the geographical origins of the club are, are not taken into consideration. And if we take a look at all of the trophies run in, in recent times, it's Manchester United, sorry, it's Manchester City mm -hmm. uh, based in UAE. Uh, it's Chelsea, Russia. Uh, Leicester won the Premier League. They're owned by Thai operators. We've got uh, we've got Arsenal, who are based in in uh, in the US. So so it's a long time since an English owned football club uh, actually last won a trophy. We probably have to go back to Wigan Athletic winning the FA Cup, uh, wow. and, and that was about eight or nine years ago. Kieran Maguire, thank you very much for shining a light there and informing us all on this extraordinary sale. That was Kieran Maguire, finance lecturer at the University of Liverpool. It's now 2.45, folks, and it's time for my Scrap Reform Keep segment. On Saturday, the Eurovision Song Contest is back on our screens. And by the way, I'm firmly in the Keep camp. I might have voted to leave the European Union, but I very much want us to start winning Eurovision. It's been with us since 1957, folks, and I think it's fair to say that Great Britain has been a country with very limited success. You have to go back quite some time. But here, though, is one of our winners. Back in 1981, Buck's face sealed the victory with making your mind up. For those listening on radio there, we've just shown a clip of Jay and uh, the Bucks Fizz crew working out there in that music video. Jay, I just want to find out, first of all, are you actually of the view that we take Eurovision seriously? Oh, we've lost Jay there. Right, we'll get Jay back up in a second. Right, so now it's time for Grime Watch, some where I look at some of the biggest stories of the week and see what you've actually said about them. Because ultimately, folks, your view is much more important than my big gob. The mother of baby P could be released from prison within weeks after the parole board rejected a government challenge against its ruling. Tracy Connolly was jailed in 2009 after admitting, causing or allowing the death of 17-month-old son, Peter, at home in Tottenham. Now, folks, I strongly believe, right, that if you take a child's life, you ought to serve life. And here's what you've had to say to that. Tone said, if you take a life, you've forfeited your own life. Why do these evil people think they should have, have a life when they've taken one away from their victim? Tracy said, I had to read the report as part of my degree. What I read still stays with me 10 years on. I know, I, I said the same about Baby P, reading about an earlobe dislocated, hanging off 
from this poor Ben's head, what this monster did is absolutely unconscionable. Ian says, it was so terrible, horrific, shocking and heartbreaking, that poor little boy, she should never, ever be released. And I couldn't agree with that more, Ian. And I say to you, Ian, we have become a soft touch nation, a nation in which this sort of thing, we just, uh, it, it breaks my heart, it really, really does. Sally says, I think capital punishment should be reinstated. A life for life, especially in such cruel, horrifying circumstances. Let me know if you agree with Sally, gbviews at gbnews.uk, get involved. And Ken said, yes, she is a total monster, but blame the judicial system. There should be always, there should always be a chance of rehabilitation and redemption after doing the time you've been given by a judge. Maybe it's the judges who have been too soft. I'm sorry, but I don't, I, I disagree with Ken. I think he, Ken's right to say she's a total monster, but I don't think there's redemption and rehabilitation for someone that has done something like that. I mean, I'm not sure that any justice system could rehabilitate someone so cruel. Linda, finally, she said, this mother and her partner should never be released to torture and kill a defenseless baby is pure evil. There we have it, folks. Now, after the parole board rejected a government challenge against its ruling to release her, Justice Secretary Dominic Raab condemned the decision and said that the decision to release her demonstrates why the parole board needs a fundamental overhaul. Truly horrifying stuff, folks. Now, it's 2.48 and it's time for our campus clash. We've, coming up, we're discussing paperless GCSEs, right? So apparently, the government are going to put in place paperless GCSEs and A-levels. Ofqual have said that they are exploring the option of the exams going paperless in order to suit candidates' abilities in real time. However, this has raised concerns about the opening, the possibility of students cheating. So, joining me are Jude Delasio, who is a councillor and school governor, and Jude Lavos, two Judes, a prospective politics and international relations student. Uh, Jude Lavos, can I start with you, please? Wouldn't it, yeah, wouldn't going paperless be beneficial for the environment, right? Some people have said, well, hang on. This is going to be environmentally friendly. So, you know, all of this stuff about cheating, you could say that about so many things. I mean, I did my provisional driving test on a computer. You could have argued that at one point I could have cheated on that, couldn't you? Well, I mean, the, the whole cheating point is exactly that. I mean, you can cheat with a pen and paper as much as you can cheat with a computer. I did some of my exams on computers. And like you said, you did your, your driving, your driving test on a computer as well. Um, I, I think they should go, I think they should go paperless because you know, the, the whole, the whole point about cheating is you can, you can really cheat on anything. It's, it's more up to the person themselves, not the, the way we examine. Uh, I think it would, it would sort of level the playing field for those people who have special educational needs. People with dyslexia might have trouble reading those words on the paper. Uh, maybe you can enlarge it, you know, use fonts that are more friendly to that sort of thing, which I think would, would help level the playing field and make it easier for those people to do better in their exams. Yeah, Jude Delasio, do you agree with those sentiments? Do you think this is, going, this is actually a more inclusive way to do examinations? Uh, well, thank you, Darren. I must admit, I, I respectfully disagree. I don't think we should uh, take exams paperless. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a, a story why. Um, when I was in school, only a few years ago, just before the pandemic, uh, the possibility of digital exams uh, was floated then. And do you know what the first thing one of my friends said to me was? He said, great, if I do it at home digitally, I can have all my revision notes in front of me, and I know that'll be a great way to cheat. And I think that will always be the danger. I think it's wide open uh, to cheating and exploitation um, if the uh, exams are done digitally at home. Uh, if they're done uh, theory test environment, um, then I don't really see what problems uh, that solves which were present in physical exams. Uh, I must admit, I think we're uh, in danger of trying to fix something which isn't broken here. Um, nice. And that's a particularly dangerous thing to do when we're tampering with something as precious as education. Do you not think, though, if online assessments had been available during the pandemic, for example, it might have been, it, well, we might have got away with not having to cancel all summer exams for two whole years really impacting the potential of, of, of young people to get ahead in their future careers, et cetera, et cetera. Some people were very upset about the way in which these exams and, and grades were actually dished out, weren't they? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and Jude raised a good point there, I think digital exams are a good thing uh, to have in the back pocket, for example, if we had uh, another lockdown. Uh, but I think really um, in peacetime and, and uh, for future exams, I think really if you were going to uh, try to, to stop te uh, cheating, really what you'd need is probably to actually film uh, pupils taking their exams or perhaps even have some sort of uh, machine learning algorithm, which is then trained to spot signs of cheating. But I think we're way off that in Britain at the moment. So I just think let's keep digital exams for our, our lockdown measures. Uh, but in peacetime, I just think it's going to be wide open to abuse. And I don't think uh, uh, it really solves a problem uh, with, with physical exams. Jude Lavos, teachers in England have, have been saying actually recently that there are high levels of anxiety among pupils in the run-up to GCSEs and A-levels with reports of panic attacks, angry outbursts, self-harm and disengagement among students who will be the first to sit examinations in three years, as I, as I mentioned, because of the pandemic. Is this something that you've experienced firsthand? Um, no, I, I did my examinations pre-pandemic, um, but I did use them digitally just for other reasons aside from the pandemic. Um, and I think when it comes to nerves, because people have been so used to, you know, studying at home and doing their, their learning at home, I think it would work well as a sort of transitionary period um, when it comes to doing your exams when you're sort of back in school and now that the pandemic's sort of over in, in that sense. Um, I think it would work well as a transitionary period and, and it would work well as an experiment to see do digital exams work because you've got to think yeah. examination papers are, are very important materials you don't want them getting lost you don't want them they having to be transported huge distances to get to get graded right and um, if if we turn that digital then it would ensure that we have those protected as well do you know i actually struggle with this this idea that turning on a computer to do your exam could trigger a panic attacks and, and anxiety outbursts i mean if this is happening I've just mentioned at the start of the show that today is VE Day, right? So that generation mm -hmm. went through bombs and bullets. If you can't handle turning yeah. on a computer to do an exam, I mean, what's the world coming to? I mean, I was, I was less anxious doing my exams on a computer um, than I was doing it in, on, on a pen and paper. That's just me personally. And I know that, you know, people deal with exam stress in many different ways. Exams are an anxious time for everyone. Um, and I think whether we do them on paper or whether we do them on a computer um, will be determined by the, the person individually. Jude um, Delasio, you know, are we, we are we, uh, it's the next generation of young people. Let's not forget our, our next generation who are going to actually be responsible for Britain's future. Are we a, a snowflake generation in which we can't handle these sort of things? I mean, perhaps, but I think really the the crucial point for me um, as a school governor, as you mentioned, is that this seems to be some sort of experiment uh, with digital exams. But I just don't think that something as precious as the education of young people should be seen as an experiment. And of course, none of us like exams. That would be rather weird if you did well, like indeed. exams. Well, uh, indeed. But they are part and parcel of education. Uh, yeah. and I just don't think that the, uh, people's problems with in-person exams are all going to be solved with digital ones. Thank you very much for your contribution, the two of you. The two Jude's, you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for your company. This show's on every Saturday and Sunday at 2pm, but I'm off on holiday next week. But for now, folks, I'm going to leave you with the weather. Hopefully it's nice for you. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking fine for much of the country, though there will be a few showers in the north. Let's take a look at the details. Heading first to southwest England, and here, after a rather cloudy start to the day, it'll be mostly sunny to end, with generally light winds too. A similar picture over in the southeast. Plenty of late sunshine this evening, leading into a clear night, although that does mean it will turn quite chilly. There'll be patchy cloud for most of Wales this evening, but it's going to stay dry and many should have some decent sunny breaks. That's how it's also looking around the West Midlands, with some sunny spells lingering through the evening and temperatures holding up into the high teens Celsius. It should feel quite warm. There's a small chance of one or two showers around northern England this evening, but for many it will be dry with some late sunny breaks. And it will also feel cooler near the coast. 
There'll also be one or two showers across Scotland. Far northern and northwestern parts may be cloudier with a little bit of rain. Otherwise, there will be some sunny spells. In Northern Ireland, it's looking largely cloudy, especially in the west, where a few spots of rain are likely. The best of any late sunshine will be in the east. So wet and blustery weather will push in from the northwest overnight, whilst it will turn chilly under clear skies in the southeast. And that's how it's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me, Anaya Falar and Iman for the discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here from big ideas to questions shaping the public conversation. We tackle the moral, cultural and political implications of news stories. We need to share this conversation democratically. It has become so toxic, this debate. They relish this kind of discourse. From fascinating guests to challenging ideas, you won't want to miss it. The discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here, GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point.